Yeah, good morning, everyone. And um, thanks to Moritz again also for the organizing part here. And yeah, also pleasure to join us here. Um, just small background on me. I'm working as a journalist since uh, 15 years, approximately. Um, newspapers, TV, and um, then I also moved into PR for a couple of times. And um, for example, also working in the automotive industry in PR. And in 2013, I went fully back to journalism again because that's kind of where I'm coming from, and uh, that's also what I what I love to do. And um, there, thanks to Autogefuel, it did also work to make a living out of it. And um, we'll tell you more about that later. And I think I'll need about 45 minutes, something from a lecture, and maybe an hour, and, and then we have a lot of time also for discussion because that will most time be the most interesting part because I'm sure there will be some questions where I think oh. I want to know this, um, you know, about the automotive industry, especially in Germany, or about certain brands or maybe certain cars, because um, you know we're covering about 30 different brands in Germany here, and um, you know we're traveling also all over Europe or all in the world, and so we are um, also getting some insight or some secret hints always from um, certain brands and where actually everything is heading to. And um, well, basically we'll focus on the automotive industry in general and then have a focus as well on the German automotive industry because it's obviously what's maybe the most interesting part for you. And um, some of the places you are going to still, um, we can also talk about um, because I've been there as well, of course, and can give you some insight before you're actually there. Maybe you can surprise some of your hosts then there. But I thought uh, we maybe start um, with uh, waking you up. I'm not sure um, if you have slept well. Maybe it was a long night, so I thought um, it's just uh, internal speakers here, but maybe something to wake you up. was the Audi R8 and um, has an acceleration figure from 0 to 200 kilometers or 0 to 125 miles per hour, like normal cars have hardly to 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour. And yeah, I was actually also really driving that one. It was uh, close to a race circuit. And it's yeah, really strange feeling to experience something like that, but you get used to it. And um, well, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Basically, what we've seen here in the beginning is what we define as the, let's say, current or, or maybe already even past thing when we talk about emotions and, um, and the automotive industry. Um, that's where, at the moment, everyone says, oh, well, that's a great sound and a great performance. But I can already tell you, this won't be going on for such a long time. And um, this just a few days ago where the um, head of, new head of Audi, um, he said that in 2025, so not too far, this Audi will not develop any more combustion engines. And that's a big statement. And I think we know where everything is heading to then. And um, so I also want to focus on different mega trends here today, because, you know, I think it was Bill Clinton who said you um, shouldn't just focus on the headlines, you should f follow the trends. And so electrification is surely one of them. Here we can see the Tesla Model S. It's not a real German model, but I want to start with the Tesla because it also shows what the German automotive industry has missed in the past years. The second mega drug trend is connectivity. We see it here with this huge screen we have here in the Model S as well. Um, you can also check an auto view there, for example. Um, not exactly while you're driving. Well, you have to hack it into it, then it's also possible. And the third mega trend is autonomous driving. And I've tested it recently also in the Tesla Model S. And uh, well, it's the first time I've done it in that case also on the motorway. And 
That's maybe even a stranger feeling than this hard acceleration in an Audi R8 because you really, you know, you can relax and the system just works. Um, some people have great doubts about it. Um, this one here in the Model S is the best autopilot there is so far because I've tested the other systems with the German man manufacturers as well. And the big advantage of that one here is you can set the, the destination in the GPS and then the car follows that road. For example, I had one situation where I had, had not put it in a GPS and the car was you know, right or left, had to decide, and the car couldn't decide. But if I would put it in the GPS, the car would have known where to go right or left. Um, about one week ago, I tested the autopilot in the Mercedes E-Class. On the motorway, it's the better autopilot. It kind of feels more refined, smoother in the transitions when braking, accelerating. Also the lane change, you just have to put down the, the turning indicators and then the car does the lane change itself. But when you leave the motorway, it doesn't really work that well anymore and there the Tesla really is. So my verdict was if you would combine the autopilot from the Tesla and the current E-Class, then you would have the perfect system. However, if you think about how much the German automotive industry is really lagging behind that one. Tesla, for example, is doing something um, they're actually not allowed to because there aren't the governmental regulations yet to actually really offer such a system. But Tesla, as quite often, they just said, I don't know, who cares? We just do it. And the same they did with the electrification. And I have had some inside talks um, with engineers from the German automotive industry and they said, oh, they can't do that. That's just some laptop batteries they are connecting and that's not an automotive battery. That's not good enough and it's too dangerous. They're just saying that to cover themselves and um, they are then two, three years to reach this, that's the stage at the electrification that Tesla has already reached now. So this is not a lecture on how bad the German automotive industry is. I just <laughs> wanted to, <laughs> I just want to start with the challenges, what they have missed. But I mean, I want to know from you, uh, and that also tells us, of course, something. So what is your favorite automotive brand? Maybe we can just... Your favorite automotive brand? Just tell us something. BMW. Uh, probably Audi. BMW. Porsche. Mercedes. I'm just a car guy. I don't have a favorite. Okay. Yeah. BMW. That's what. Okay. Motorcycle driver. <laughs> <laughs> Motorcycle driver. Okay. 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 Okay, so we had um, in a round long, like two times Tesla, I think 10 times BMW, something like that, and then Audi, Porsche, and just one Ford, three, three, three. yeah, and one, one car guy, everything, yeah, Mercedes as well. And you see where, where this is going to. Um, so the German brands, especially the premium brands, they are known all over the world. They're one of the strongest brands overall, if you look at you know, every industry branch. And um, you know, everyone has somehow a connection when you say Audi, Mercedes, uh, or, or BMW. And this has, of course, a reason. And well, the main reason is, I think, just performance. And of course, the look and feel. And this is a very interesting fact also when we do our reviews because there are some guys who say, oh, you know, I'm a fan of Japanese cars and you are always rating German cars better. So I have no intention to rate German cars better, but as they are very successful in creating a very good look and feel, they often also lead the wording in our reviews because we cannot do an endurance test for 200,000 kilometers in a half an hour review, of course. So the look and feel accounts for more, and that's why the German brands are so good in there. Because you get in the car, and you look around it, and you feel, for example, the button, you press the handles. You know, when you're um, doing this for a job, you really try to dissect the car then. But, you know, when you're just sitting down, not thinking about that much, it's the, the overall feeling that impresses you then, because it's done for so many details. And some of the other Japanese cars, they might have better engines, and they might be uh, more durable. They lead in the durability rankings. But as for the look and feel, the German manufacturers still lead the market and it's one of the main reasons why they are also so famous all over the world. And of course, sound and performance. So it's a really, really nice screening, right? Just to relax in between, really <laughs> calm down a little bit in between. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that now you might wonder, 
why I am showing you this. Because we also want to talk about sustainability and you might wonder, what is this guy talking about? What does animal abuse have to do with the automotive industry? And actually it has to do a lot. Because, well, one of the main products that are used, especially in premium cars, is leather. And leather is always thought about, okay, this is top luxury. Is it really? Well, I thought so too. And I've bought two, two cars with leather in my life so far. And I also thought, that, well, this is, you know, the pinnacle of luxury, of course. Until I first experienced, well, what about, you know, the features when driving a car? Well, it's totally hot in summer, you stick to the seats, and it's cold in winter times, so you need seat heating and possibly also seat cooling. So just from the practicability aspects, for example, materials like Alcantara, Microfiber, or Dynamica, so there's uh, the two brands, Alcantara and Dynamica. But it's like, um, you know, with Nutella, for example, it's used as a term itself, you know, to describe a certain surface material. And, well, not every manufacturer is really thinking about this sustainability aspect. And they, for example, just say, oh, well, the animals are killed for the meat first, and then the leather is used. But the question is, does it matter what for a living being is killed for? I mean, it's, it matters that it gets killed, not like, I'm, I'm not going to you and oh, I kill you to um, get your purse, you know, but I didn't, I want to kill you at all, just to get your purse, you know, that it's, it's nonsense, it's a nonsense argument, and that's why I also want to strengthen your senses for this issue, because more and more people are getting aware of it, and for example, Tesla is offering, again, Tesla is leading the way there, they are offering the, the Model X, for example, in a vegan version, and um, a couple of years ago, it was, would have been inconceivable. And later on, I'll also show you um, just a short bit of another lecture that happened um, at, uh, at Mercedes lately. And I was also surprised myself to see that, so um, also um, look out for that one. So the awareness is increasing and uh, manufacturers are offering also more and more alternatives. And the funny thing is that Mercedes is really leading the way there in very good alternatives. Because, for example, when you get a um, high AMG spec car, they usually start with microfiber on the inside and leatherette or faux leather on the outside. And that's a very good combination if you combine sustainability, sportiness, and also a high-class premium approach. Other manufacturers, however, still think, you know, the genuine leather is the way to go. But I can promise you, um, I'm not sure uh, what, which opinion you have at the moment, but when I started talking about that, people were laughing about it. I know maybe saying, oh, this guy is totally crazy. But I'm realizing that over the years, more and more people get aware of it. And I'm kind of promising you, in about five years from now, it will be totally normal for a car manufacturer to offer especially non-leather versions of a car. That will become definitely a standard. And you know it now already so far. So... Um, <clears throat> yeah, what about, uh, what about the German car industry in general? Um, what is good to know is we sell about 3 million cars here inside Germany. This one is the most sold car and also the leading brand, Volkswagen. Now, after the diesel car, everyone knows it, but um, yeah, we'll also talk about that very soon. This one here is the GTE version, by the way. Oh, it's a lovely picture, right? I love it. Um, GTE version, it's uh, electrification plus petrol engine, and there's also the e-Golf that is pure electric. That's with a standard German plug you can plug in at home, for example, and um, <clears throat> most of the electric cars, you don't really need this huge wall box system, you just plug them in overnight, and um, 23 hours a day, a car is standing still. And um, that's also the reason why you know, you have plenty of time to recharge. Um, this one here is the normal petrol engine now. This is the, the GTI, GTI Performance to be exact, 230 horsepower. And, well, we can listen to the sound here. Screaming tires. <laughs> yeah, and this one is um, the second most selling car in Germany is the Volkswagen Passat. So Volkswagen is leading kind of with their most important models. Um, in Golf, we have about 230,000 Golf at least sold per year, um, Passat about 70,000. Um, so those two models are leading by far in the domestic German market. And it's kind of a tradition to buy Golf. And the funny thing is, um, 
it's also still the dream car. And then, you know, when you do some surveys, people say, a Golf is my dream car. And nowadays it's, well, you think it's a cheap car. No, it's not a cheap car. A Golf is easy to put a Golf to 40,000 euros or something like that. So it's really a dream car. The third selling car, third best selling car, is also from Volkswagen in Germany. It's, it's the Polo. So Golf, compact class, Passat midsize. This one here, the small car segment then. This is also a Polo GTI. You see it also with the red stripe in the front and bigger alloys. Second brand in the sales figures is Mercedes, here with the S-Class Coupe. Very, very, very beautiful car, definitely. And, um, well, the thing is, you might not expect that Mercedes is a second most selling car because they're very expensive. But that's also crucial for the German market. It's not about which car is, you know, the cheapest. It's rather more the other way around. And that's why number three in the sales figures is Audi on the do domestic market. And um, there are also a lot of the very expensive cars getting sold. And um, the market has moved on more to a commercial market. That means a lot of guys, you know, who are self-employed, they get it over their company. And so they can also de deduct the very expensive cars over, um, over their, their, their taxes. Um, or, for example, you are in a company and get a company car, and then it's also quite famous to get the very expensive cars. And that's also why the German manufacturers can live off the domestic market. It's most of the time that the premium manufacturers sold their very expensive cars to business customers. And to BMW, this one is the fourth place in the sales figures right now in Germany. And you see this one here is the new concept of the i8. We will talk more about that later as well, because this concept here, I think it was a quite interesting view. This one is converging technologies. I've mentioned before, electrification, autonomous driving, and connectivity. Um, for example, you get that live traffic information and stuff like that. And then there's Ford. You might think, oh, well, it's a true, genuine US company. But well, you will see it yourself. They are also building a lot of vehicles here in Germany, even vehicles that are shipped over to the US. For example, the all new Ford Focus RS, which is, you know, uh, very famous worldwide. This one here is the, uh, the new Galaxy. And um, they are also pretty good in the sales figures in, in Germany. Um, so what about the segments overall? We have about 25% in the compact segment, for example. Well, there's also a reason um, why the Golf is in there. And then the mid-size segment is also very important, especially for the business customers, you know, typical car where you ride, a, you know, maybe 40,000 kilometers a year and uh, you want to sell your, you know, multi-purpose blender or your whatever you, you have to offer there. Um, the other segments um, are not that relevant. The small car segment is also quite, a, quite important, <clears throat> almost the same share as a mid-size segment, about 10 or 250 percent. And then everything else. Also, the segments where the Germans are very famous worldwide. For example, if you think about Audi A8, Mercedes S-Class, and, and BMW 7 Series, they are hardly sold in Germany because there's no market for it. Um, there are some of the business fleets, for example, where politicians are, are being driven or something like that, but those are really very small numbers. And um, in the private market, this doesn't exist at all. And that's also the reason why, especially in Germany, you can get cars very cheaply in the bigger classes if you buy them used. For example, you can get a maybe four or five year old BMW 7 Series for, I don't know, 30,000 euros. And um, if you consider that car maybe was at 110,000 euros, that's a pretty big gap. However, you know, coming from the US, in general, cars are more expensive here if you, um, when I look at the US prices because Autogefühl has also the main target roof is US and Germany, actually. And then UK is also pretty strong. Um, if we look at the U US prices, we say, oh, well, if I would live in the US, I would get three cars at once. <laughs> Especially if you think, for example, for, for a Ford Mustang, I think it's available in the US for about $22,000 or something like that. Um, it's double the price here in Germany. And so you have re you're really lucky that you have very low car prices. Um, interesting fact is as well um, that the Japanese cars are especially cheap in the US if you compare it to Europe or especially to Germany. And that's also another reason why the Japanese cars are not that successful here in Germany because you don't save so much money. In the US it's often quite an easy decision. You see, oh well, they are very good in durability facts and they're pretty cheap to afford and so I just go for the Japanese car, you know. But here in Germany you think about, oh, well, I'll maybe pay the same price and well, then I just 
go for the German car. And, um, another reason is that the German manufacturers that they are building here, you know, they want to make a lot of figures as well here, and um, so they are having this um, very good leasing offers sometimes. And especially lately, this has been a very interesting development, also has something to do with the diesel gate, to improve the image, of course, and to get people in the cars, because what could they do after this image loss from Volkswagen and Audi? Well, if you say, here, this is a new Audi A5 for 200 euros a month leasing without any prepayment, without any, you know, any bogus, and that's it. And I say, okay, I don't care about Dieselgate, give me that A5 for 200 euros a month. And this, the deal is done. And that's what they're, what they're doing at the moment. There was even a Volkswagen up, you know, this very small mini car. It's a great car because it offers great space for, you know, below four meters in length. And um, that one was available for, I think, 25 euros a month without any prepayment. And I mean, that's, you know, a cell phone contract. It's uh, really incredible. And you might think, how can they really still make profit from that? Well, I think they can't. It's um, just an image building factor. And if you got people in the cars and in your brand for a very reasonable price, they won't, uh, you know, won't argue anymore about the brand. It's also a very interesting strategy they are following there at the moment. Um, the question is, of course, always um, if that will be successful on the long-term run. Um, but I mean, especially as for Audi, um, for example, also in, in my family, someone went from Ford to Audi then because of those special offers. And then you might think about, okay, if you Ford, first driven a Ford Fiesta and then moved on to the Audi A5, will you ever go to a Ford Fiesta back again? I guess not. So, and that's maybe also the strategy that's behind it. So we were talking about the automotive industry and you will also visit a, um, a plant. And I will want to stress this overview map. Yeah, that's better resolution. So um, all those red dots here are places where automotives are produced in Germany. And you see there's no real big cluster as the production plants. Interesting is that the administration, the, head, the headquarters, those have indeed clusterings um, because you first of all have just a few that are reproducing really journey and then you have the importers, for example, like Toyota and also the obvious thing from the Fiat Corporation. And just to mention that, so all the importers are usually sitting either in, in Frankfurt or in Cologne and that's kind of it. So they're really clustering there. But here we want to focus on the manufacturing and you see there are some up um, in the north, um, especially here with, with, with Volkswagen. We also go in detail with the brand logos as well. So we got one region in the north with Wolfsburg headquarters of Volkswagen and Hannover. There, there the commercial vehicles are built there. Um, then Cologne, we just have Ford. Uh, we used to have um, Opel in Bochum, quite close to where I was, uh, where I was born. Um, but that went uh, bankrupt because, uh, you know, well, People say GM did it on, on purpose, um, but you know there's has been a lot of hassle about it, and also a lot of unemployment in a region that has been uh, suffering from unemployment anyway. And then of course we have the big in the south, we have BMW in Munich, and they have also other plants. We go in detail quite soon, and of course Stuttgart with um, headquarters from Mercedes and Porsche and. Ingolstadt with Audi. And we got those um, maps here as well closer. This one here now is, um, the, is the northern part and there you can see uh, in Bremen we got a big Mercedes plant. Then in Emden it's close to the North Sea we got the Volks and the Volkswagen plant. This one here Volkswagen headquarters in Wolfsburg. There's also the called Autostadt where they have you know, a huge lineup of all of the vehicles and also customers have this kind of experience. And that has been evolving over the years that the manufacturers, they try to combine getting your car with an experience. And even as US customers, you can go to Germany and um, you know, have maybe a day in another vehicle, for example, drive an M4 at, at BMW in Munich uh, for one day and then get your normal 3 Series uh, caught up and maybe visit the plant. And those programs, um, BMW is offering that, Volkswagen as well, Audi, and um, this has been increasing over the years and people really appreciate that. And we also have in, in Osnabrück, there's also a Volkswagen and Porsche manufacturing. And you maybe know, as they're all inside the Volkswagen Corporation, Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, Seat, Skoda, and so on, they share a lot of parts. Um, yesterday I was uh, at Bentley in Crew and um, did a very great tour there. You will see that on Autoprofood as well. 
be interested in that. And um, funny thing is that there as well, they get the, the chassis of the new Bentayga from Ingolstadt, from the Q7, and they get it over there because they couldn't build it on, your, on their own. It would just, be, would just be too huge for that very small plant they have there in crew. So this is here the region north, and we want to hop over to a little bit, little bit more source. This is not the Ford um, Cologne plant. I don't have a separate um, a map of that one because it's just in Cologne, really. But they're also producing in Saar Louis. That's in the Saarland, uh, close to the French border. And interesting about that one is this, for example, also the plant where the Focus RS is being built. So especially relevant for the US customers as well. But I've heard it's already sold out from the first charge, the RS. Um, then we get Opel, again, not in Bochum anymore. They're in Rüsselsheim, that's close to Frankfurt, um, but they're still producing there. And well, they have been struggling um, over the years, but now they have improved also with a huge image campaign which worked, uh, worked out quite well, and also the um, Opel and Astra uh, became car of the year now. I don't share the opinion, I don't, well, it's not a bad car, but I also think it's, it's not an extraordinary car, so I can't, uh, can't share this view. Then the big Audi plant in, uh, in Ingolstadt, um, if you're more interested in, in that, we can, I can show you some uh, pictures of that very soon, um, but you can also watch the full episode of the A8, assembly on Autogo fuel. It's very interesting because the A8 is from all aluminum. And um, so is also special manufacturing there. Then we got the Porsche region here around Stuttgart and um, some of the parts that belong to Stuttgart, some are uh, separate cities and there are different plants here. Um, for example, in Rastatt Mercedes, they are, they are building their smaller vehicles, for example, the A-Class and B-Class. Also the CLA, by the way, I'm not sure if you, if you know the CLA, it looks like a you know, perfect whole sedan and uh, very beautiful central lines, but it's basically an A or B class just with a sedan form. And so some people say, oh, then I just get a C class because it's very expensive CLA already. And um, here in Sindelfing, um, there's the headquarters as well of Mercedes and they have um, the plant there for the bigger vehicles. So then, this was the region south. Um, then we go a little bit more <coughs> down, even more in the south to Munich BMW. There's uh, this great um, so-called BMW Welt there, where you can get your car and also have this customer experience with a factory tour. Um, they also have um, other um, other plans, for example, in, in Regensburg um, or also in Dingolfing, not a really famous city, but of course they want to, you know move some parts here and there. And sometimes it also has to do with some um, suppliers that are around that in, in, in the area. And again, we got the Audi Ingolstadt plant in there. Um, so then we should move on to Leipzig. And so, um, city, you know, especially in the eastern parts of Germany from the uh, you know, former Soviet Republic, um, they're pretty happy to have uh, those because it boosts the economy. And um, <clears throat> for example, also the big Porsche cars are uh, are built there, as well as BMW. Um, and there's another Opel plant in Eisenach, that's um, you know kind of in between east and east and the western region. And we now have another Volkswagen plant in Zwickau. So you see, Volkswagen is kind of everywhere, um, already with the manufacturing. And um, the most important point is, so why do they have such a market domination? Um, well, one big reason is that the car business, at least in Germany, is still really focused on the dealer experience. The manufacturers try to change it one by one and they want to say more over the internet because they then don't have any calls for the dealers. But at the same time, the dealers are so powerful so that the car manufacturers should pay attention. Ah, well, if the dealers get too angry, then it's also a problem for the manufacturers. And so, so far, Volkswagen has a kind of a dealership in, in every, uh, not only major city, but in every small city. And therefore, Already, for example, when every dealer says, okay, there's a new Polo, and every dealer has to get 10 cars, you know, for showroom and uh, showing purposes, and um, you have to sell 10, 20, 50 cars in the next few months. If you have maybe 1,000 dealers, and you already get so high reg registration figures, it's just because the dealers get the cars first, and you have more sales uh, than maybe some of the other importer brands do per whole year. And that also explains their market domination. There's, by the way, a very interesting story about it between Volkswagen and Opel, because you know Volkswagen also has this um, Nazi uh, background. And there was um, 
especially a thing. There was was a small story where um, uh, Hitler was um, visiting one of the big auto shows, you know, before before the war was started as well. And there was Opel and Volkswagen, and well, we're thinking about if the Volkswagen, the uh, VW Käfer or the, or the Beetle, which brand should get this major contract, which was um, you know given out by the by the state itself? And um, they were first thinking of Opel, which is you know very famous at the time, and at that time also a true German company before it was bought from uh, from GM, and. Um, it should have been. I'm not sure if it's really true. I've seen it in a, in a documentary that um, they came to um, to Mr. Opel himself and um, obviously just said, "Hello, Mr. Hitler," and that's it. And as Hitler came to the Volkswagen boot, um, they said, "You know, Heil and stuff and all of all of the nonsense," and that obviously um, made the decision then for Volkswagen. So it is said that you know, if he would have maybe like bowed properly to the to the Führer. That then maybe Opel would have got the big contract for um, for that Volkswagen car, and um, maybe nowadays the whole automotive industry in the world would look otherwise than we have here today. Um, but by the way, um, all of the manufacturers that had something to do also with war production, they have really cleared that up um, very well. And of course, it was not only um, about the German um, manufacturers. You know, maybe also Ford. Strange thing was, you know, everything of Germany was kind of bombed, but the Ford plant, you know, was not bombed because Henry Ford said to the president, okay, leave my factory alone. After the war, we need our cars. And the funny thing was that in Ford, they were also producing kind of against the alleys, all of, um, uh, you know, for example, military jeeps and stuff. And, well, that's economic power, so you can um, kind of produce for both sides to fight each other. But, yeah, that's how our economy works, obviously. And... Now let's take a deep look into the assembly plants. This one here, um, as I mentioned, this was the A8 plant in Ingolstadt. Funny thing is that Ingolstadt is a rather small city and if you go there, everyone is driving Audi. It's really like Audi Wonderland. <laughs> and yeah, it's um, because for example, all everyone is working there. I mean, everyone works for Audi there in, in, the, um, uh, in this city. Jump a little bit further, this is the A8. And it's a really strange thing if you know just see the four stars on the road then, and even some bigger cars because of the Audi workers they get, for example, also good leasing conditions for the cars. This is so-called marriage, by the way, and um, I had a discussion there lately if it's called marriage or wedding. Usually, wedding would make more sense because it's you know it's where it's taking place. But I've asked the guys at Bentley yesterday, and they said, okay, you know we are native speakers in the UK and we really call it marriage. So discussion is over. It's marriage and not wedding. <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, really interesting because um, you know when you create such a big car and put it from all aluminum, this one is about one thousand eight hundred kilograms, and um, there we get to a very interesting part because the question is which materials will be used in the future. So there are certain manufacturers, for example, Audi, also Jaguar, Landro, that really set focus on the aluminum production. But we also got BMW, which are mixing materials. For example, the new 7 Series, which is um, the competition to the A8, is now even a little bit lighter because they have mixed carbon fiber, aluminum, and steel. And because the carbon fiber is even lighter, it also tops the all-aluminum chassis from the Audi. The question is, of course, always, um, you also have to think about crashes, for example. When you crash a car, even just a little bit, a carbon fiber chassis cannot be repaired, period. Also, uh, for example, some manufacturers in sports cars put some carbon fiber wings in the front. You just scratch it at a, at a pavement or something like that, and then 2,000 euros are gone. You cannot repair it, you have to replace it completely. And therefore, it's always the question, where are you, are you using which materials? BMW did it, that they had the, the score the chassis in the carbon fiber. So if you just have small crashes in the front or the rear, you don't have to fix any carbon fiber. That's maybe a good approach. Um, and it's also you know, um, a bargain from BMW. Are they really heading there? Because they've invested a lot in this carbon fiber to the strategy and no one knows yet if it was the right strategy. And then for example, we also got Mercedes who are using pretty much steel um, still, um, also some material mixes. But also from steel, there are new techniques where you can, for example, make the layers thinner but harder at the same time. Um, so at the moment, I think we're more heading towards a clever material mix like BMW is using it with the 7 Series. Because you also always have to think about which part do I use 
for which certain area. It even comes down to using the, um, the good adhesive or, or glues on, on, the, on the cars. Um, I've seen, for example, on the, on the new Aston Martin that is coming, um, that you use less mechanical connections, because if you use a, a, le a mechanical connection um, you know, on, on, on a chassis, you could also see it right here, they're putting the, the knobs in, in there and, and screws and stuff, then you have the, the biggest pressure on the connection where the screw is driven in. And if you use this modern ad adhesive, which are really like high performance stuff, then you have the connection area throughout the bigger surface. And that's in, in increasing the rigidity of the car overall and can save weight again because you can make the material thinner again and you don't have, you know, you can leave out that, for example, if you use the adhesive. That's also a very interesting um, part where we're moving to. Yeah, that's my favorite part. <laughs> I will, I'm also building an Audi A8. And um, you see, uh, in this factory, well, it's a mix between humans and robots. Um, yesterday, as I was at Bentley, that was incredible to see. There were so many people around. You have to think about at Bentley, they built over 10,000 cars a year, just most many, and they have over 4,000 people working there. So it's almost like uh, you know two cars for one guy a year, and that's totally incredible. But that's why we're, they're doing so much handwork, and the car is at least 200,000 um, uh, uh, bucks. And here, for example, we have a mix, and um, I've also visited other manufacturers, for example, Mercedes. They are already more into this ro uh, robotic style, and. Um, what we're heading here is the so-called human robot um, corporation. And um, the thing is that they are trying to merge both worlds together. It started just, you know, with very easy solution, for example, like a rolling chair, uh, some, some mechanical help for workers that they don't have to bow, you know, each time they want to put in some screws. Then they had some assembly lines where just human work was done and machine work was done. And now everything is kind of converging in, in, in both ways. That, for example, machines head over some parts to humans, humans head over some parts to machines. Or, for example, that um, you get help, for example. You, you don't do something by your bare hands, but something is hung up on a, on a small crane, and you just have to put the direction, and uh, the crane gets all of the way. And um, this one will be increased further on, also, for example, with virtual reality, and more and more, well, humans will not completely get obsolete, but I think they will more look into now, like this year in the final finishing, checking the quality really, maybe what machines cannot see that well, or the overall look, and, um, or maybe just controlling the machines, maybe also with an uh, with a interface glasses, that's what, where, where we're heading to. Here, by the way, also an interesting part for um, uh, US customers. Um, you see there are some differences in the cars, but only if you look very closely, for example, the turning indicator lights. And so the same line here, for example, this was here, um, uh, you see if there's an additional turning indicator at the side, or if this, this part here, if it's in yellow or completely in white, that depends on the market each. Also, you see that the Chinese spec cars, they have like everything written in law, at A8, V8, uh, then everything in Chinese again, T8, dot I, T, F, S. They have everything written on that. Whereas in Germany, there's also the option to leave everything out, that you don't even have um, the A8 sign on the car. So in Germany, it's really the trend to make everything really neutral around the car, maybe hide that you're driving a very powerful car. In China, it's more about putting everything on there that everyone sees, you got the V6, you got the V8, and so on. So very funny spec here as well. <laughs> There's another plant inside. This one here is uh, in Hannover. So it's not the main Volkswagen plant, but this one here is the one of Volkswagen commercial vehicles, or also called in Germany Volkswagen Nutzfahrzeuge. They're both belonging to the same corporation, but funny thing is they are treated as it would be like Volkswagen, Audi, and Skoda. It's also the Volkswagen commercial vehicles. So they're kind of a separate brand even if they share the same brand identity with the Volkswagen passenger vehicles. This one here is the new T6 hanging up there. And that's also an interesting strategy because, especially when we do our reviews, we're always talking about new cars, all new cars, facelifted ones. What is a new generation, what is not? The manufacturers, they always try to say, this is the new Passat, this is the new Polo, and maybe if it's just get some new headlights. 
So we try to dissect it for the viewers to say, okay, which is a product update and what is an all new generation? So if the car has been rebuilt completely or if it's just a headlight change. So it's kind of our task as well. Here with the T6, with the transporter, that is a good question because the T5 generation before, well, they say it's a completely new generation, but it's also questionable if it's really a new generation because they haven't changed that much. Headlights, of course, again, um, but then also infotainment system, but the whole structure of the car relatively remained the same. But now it gets interesting because here, especially at the commercial vehicles from Volkswagen, this one here also has a strategy because the customers are relatively conservative and especially a lot of business customers who maybe have driven these cars for 20 years for their small and uh, medium enterprises. And um, then maybe it cannot be too good if you change something completely. It can also be an advantage to stay relatively conservative in a technology process and just say, okay, we don't try to um, exaggerate everything. We try to remain at the rather same level, just refine something um, because maybe you scare away some, some other old customers. Um, in comparison to that, for example, um, you surely know the, the new Mercedes A-Class that came out a couple of years ago. That was, for example, a total change from a new van-style car for rather elderly people to a modern, sporty, compact car for younger customers. And the other manufacturers were really happy about that. For example, Volkswagen with a cheaper sports van or also BMW with the new vans they've built because they, oh, now we get all the A-Class customers because they all went away from that one. At the other hand, Mercedes also got new younger customers and that was maybe an investment um, for the future because Mercedes has the oldest customers of all brands in Germany and well, at some point there, will be no, there won't be customers anymore <laughs> to take it in a nice way. And so it's maybe also, you know, you lose some elderly customers there but you gain new, younger customers. Make, I think with the new A-Class they put the average age about five, six, seven years lower and that can also be a big, big advantage then for the future. So there you see that um, if you may be one of the future managers, you always have to think not only what's happening now, not following the, the headlines, but really the trends. What are our customers expecting? Are there maybe more conservative customers and I don't want to you know, annoy them too much? I will really get a more a low profile in the refinement process, more sort and set on the evolution. Or do I want to have new customers? Do I want to have younger customers and maybe have to change something overall again? Maybe have to lose something but gain something on the other hand. You see also um, the whole factory here is also a rather old one. That uh, means the, all the processes we've seen here, they have been running for a lot of years. They are reinvesting now to also to, to robotize some of the processes here. Um, this one here is one very good example for that one that is, has been just built a couple of months ago. And this one is one of the biggest facilities in Europe overall as for automatic press shops. You see it here, those huge tools, they press it together and then you get, for example, a chassis part or a, or a door part. See how huge those tools are. And uh, it's about 150 meters long, so it's almost like a city in itself. And um, what is also changed, they have those rolling doors there just because it's so loud when all of the stuff is happening. And um, they're just like two people in a, um, in a control center. And you see here, the parts are automatically pick, picked up. And then again, over to the human. So it's still at the moment going back and forth between human and robot, especially in some of the more conservative plants. This one, by the way, is also a nice insight what um, the apprentices could, can do if they really, you know, free to do something. This is the Volkswagen Amarok in a special style. They've just cut away the roof and make some kind of pickup here. And they're also using this for factory tours. So or everyone can get factory tours here in the German manufacturing plants. And for example, they can also drive there in the Volkswagen Amarok because those manufacturing plants are really huge. Most of the traffic, by the way, in there happens via bicycle. That's also a funny thing always. And uh, people, as we were uh, visiting there, they were a little bit annoyed because the group of journalists were standing in between. They always had to get off the biker's bicycle, uh, get it rolling again uh, after a few hours. But, you know, they have to live by that. So I'm scrolling further to this part now here. And 
we now focus on one of our mega trends and that is electrification. I've talked about the Volkswagen Golf earlier. This one here now is the e-Golf. And it was said to be that this one here is you know, groundbreaking, especially for the German electric market, but it wasn't. So, and the main reason for that is that the range, this one is by the way, the Volvox, 1,000 to 1,500 euros or dollars to put that one up. Then you can reduce the charging from about eight hours for the full charge to maybe four, three hours. So that reduces the charge in half. We have those loading stations here most of the time from some energy companies, but that's more, you know, it doesn't really help you in everyday driving, but because what you really need is a charging possibility at home. And so I think the main issue is not about do we have the, the, the big range, do we have the charging possibilities. For example, I'm living in a quite new building with a basement garage. There's no plug whatsoever. What shall I do? I just park my car down there and then it's done. So and there would be have been some, maybe some regulations needed saying if new buildings are getting done, you have to have one, just a standard plug at every parking box, for example. That would, have be, that would be a great solution where it could solve this infrastructure problem. Yeah, um, there are some charging possibilities um, at work that is theoretically possible, um, but most of the time it's just, for example, at car manufacturers or at energy companies that have the know-how and also the, the money to put all of this stuff, because if you maybe a normal mid-sized company, you wouldn't afford it. You know, because you know hardly any of the, of you guys have electric cars. You don't have electric cars in your fleet, and so it's always the, you know the, the hen egg problem. What what comes first? Um, at the moment, I think it's only really making sense to get the electric car if you have either the loading possibility at work or at home. And then I mean, then it's even enough to have maybe 30 or 40 kilometers range of a car, because especially in Europe. Um, think about 80% of all of the daily commutes are maybe 20 kilometers maximum. So most people will just be satisfied with a very low range. That's not the main problem. Really, it's the loading infrastructure also to get the small ranges up again. But, however, people have to have the security to say, okay, I can maybe drive from, uh, you know, from, from, from Düsseldorf to, to Frankfurt. I think it will only be succeeding when you have two or three hundred kilometers range, not if you, that you really need it, but just people think, okay, I have this, I, I don't want to be, you know, getting on the side, uh, side with it if the car is em empty or something like that. So I think um, there has to be built on several stages, but so far, most of the corporations are holding back as for this one. And um, also, and so some public loading stations, it's sometimes the problem, um, then you have maybe, uh, someone who's getting um, subventions for some electric cars, and then the loading stations are blocked kind of 24 seven, and the cars are not really moved. So um, I think it will only work real if you're getting the private sector in there and the private customers and they create more pressure. At the moment, I think it's more really like if you have maybe a separate house, or, for example, uh, you can get a plug outside, um, you have a good parking spot where you can really plug in the car. But I hope this will change over the years. Um, one of the latest news is that we now also have subventions in Germany for electric cars. That hasn't been the case. So far, the electric market is more, was more about in Europe, Norway and Netherlands. For example, in Netherlands, um, they had this special tax system where usually you have to, when you get a business car, and also use it in the private life. You have to um, pay 1% of, um, of the list price of the car per month. Um, you have to add that to, to your taxes, and that can get very expensive. In the Netherlands, they had the regulations now, if you get an electric car or a hybrid, this one is done. It's, so you're saving money each month, and that's also, for example, why all of the Volvo um, uh, plug-in hybrids of the V60, they were almost like 99% directly shipped in the Netherlands. You couldn't get the uh, plug-in hybrid from the V60 in other countries because it was kind of pre-ordered for the Netherlands. Um, I also got some figures of you um, to show you, like, how we are lagging behind in that case. And at the moment, we got 61 million vehicles overall in Germany. Not all driving around, also a lot of them are just standing still. And we got just 25,000 electric cars. And that's kind of nothing. Now we got those subventions. It's 4,000 euros per car. And it's split in 2,000 from the state and 2,000 from the manufacturers. This deal is uh, hardly criticized because, um, well, people say 
the manufacturers here, they missed the electric trend. And now they're even getting help for missing the electric trend. That is what you could say against it. You could, for example, but also argue for it, just you know, to get awareness, say, okay, we help people because um, there were some calculations that when you buy a normal car in the petrol engine and in the fully electric engine, the difference in price is about 5,000 euros when the, with the same spec. And so with this 4,000 euros subvention, you kind of even out this disadvantage you have. And I think it is a good start, um, even if at this given point, um, this one, by the way, here is the A7 Atron. I can also let that run. It's also interesting as for the concept because the question is always, we're always talking about electrification and it's best for the environment, period. Well, at the moment, not really. If you want to buy the most environmentally friendly car at the moment, it would be from CNG, from a natural gas. Because if you combine everything, like the production process, how much energy goes into the production process, for example. What do you do later on with, for example, we have the batteries or you know, all the hazardous stuff you get in there. So at the moment, CNG is the best way overall. But it's, of course, also nothing from renew renewable energy. And um, we are at the stage where, you know, if we get the batteries to a way that you can produce them with less energy use and more efficient, again, for example, as Tesla is trying to do now with the new Gigafactory they're building, so the cost for batteries will shrink then, then, you know, it, it, it can get better. But, I mean, you can also not say, let's forget about electrification because CNG is better. And then we know we, we won't get anywhere. So at, at one stage, you have to start the development also to make it more environmentally friendly in the long term run. And you only can build electric cars on a wide scale if they are sold on a wide scale. That's again a hen egg problem, um, but somewhere it has to start. And well, it's increasing. Um, some, some worldwide figures I also got. Um, so, worldwide, we got about 1.3 million electric cars. But then again, from 1 billion cars overall. You see very small segments so far, but over the years it has been increasing and now I think it will also um, increase in, in Germany. Um, in the US, um, yeah? Yeah, um, that's, uh, that's a really, really good aspect. Um, you see it here, by the way, this is uh, the fuel cell car. So this one here um, combines a fuel cell and the electric engine. It's a different approach. And um, the main question here is indeed, fuel cell has a disadvantage. It's very, very expensive. And a normal car would cost me 1,000, 200,000 euros for just a very tiny car. With the fully battery cars, which I'm at the moment more convinced of because you know, fuel cell, I think it will remain at this very expensive stage for, for a longer time. I think the fully electric cars, we see it already right now, are now already less expensive. And now, indeed, you have to get some ideas. What do you do with the batteries at the end of the lifespan? There are certain warranties the manufacturers give on the batteries at the moment, most of six, seven years. And they are, for example, experimenting with putting the old batteries, which are not that good on the capacity anymore, that they can be used in cars, and then connect, like, 20, 50, 100 of them and make you know, an energy saving plant from that one. Because also with, this, um, uh, with energy change here in Germany, more moving to sustainable energy with solar and, and wind power, the main problem is not that we produce enough energy. We have plenty of energy. That's, that's just you know, um, the, the nu nuclear lobby. They are saying we don't have enough energy. But that's just because they still want to earn money with their old energy, um, which they have missed the new trends. So what is happening that the big energy companies, they will more move towards a form of that they are more a distributor and help connect the grid and not initially produce the power. Power in future will be produced more on, the, on, on local and regional levels with smaller power and then it will all be combined. And there where um, your aspect is setting in because if we then have such, um, you know, blocks maybe from 100 or 200 old car batteries. Then, for example, during the day when the wind is blowing, energy can be saved there if too much power is produced and then be used later on when there's no wind, for example. So this concept is at the moment, I think, one of the most promising ones, but definitely um, this using of the batteries afterward is one of the big challenges we still have to face. We have to see what's, what's coming out there, um, but I think those 
block plans or saving, um, this could be one solution where you can still use the batteries if they are, if they are combined. Yeah. So I'm not too familiar with the batteries, but if, let's say, if you were to use the plant and after like 10 years, wouldn't you yeah. become obsolete? Yes, uh, yes. Um, at some point, they will become obsolete, indeed. I'm quite sure of that as well. Um, the question is then, if there was, for example, some companies will emerge that kind of handle the processing, because at the moment you don't have you know, so much huge batteries that need processing afterwards. But always when something needs to be done, um, the question is, will there be some expert then maybe focusing on that, reusing it, or for example, getting the raw materials out again. Um, it's a funny um, um, story, by the way, also with um, heritage cars. Some people say there will not be heritage cars in the future because the cars we have today, they are you put all of the electronics in them and when the electronics fail, it's done. The vintage cars we had so far, you could just keep them running if you know some uh, rust on the axle, or replace the axle and also big, big uh, money business, for example, um, the manufacturers, they are producing those, reproducing those old parts and selling them for big money because if you're doing something as a hobby, you're investing a lot of money in that. <laughs> I know personally from, for example, mountain biking, uh, you know, I'm checking out and not too much money for this, for this, for this, and but, oh, mountain bike has to be top, you know, big money. That's, and the same is, for example, with the vintage car scene. And, um, and I think what will be happening is there will be still vintage cars, also from today's cars, because there will be companies who are, will reproduce these electronic control units on a wider scale and for cheap money. Because nowadays there are also manufacturers for you know, old alloys and old axles. So in future, I guess, there will also be the manufacturing of electronic control units, if you can do that on, the, on, the, on a wider scale. It's just a question, will there be a market? And you have to think about, well, there are you know, millions of cars that are in this generation. The only thing I could imagine where this will not be happening is that those cars will be forbidden inside the cities. And that could be a huge change indeed, because I think the first one will be definitely the, the big Chinese megacities, because they have so much problems with their air pollution. They have to do something at, at one. Especially when you look at some regulations in Germany. In Germany it won't happen because the car lobby is too strong here. Um, but for example also in the Netherlands and Norway, they are already now thinking about that new cars yes, for the registrations are only from electric powertrains. And that will be huge. And they are planning that not for 20, in 20 years, for like in, in five years. And you have to know that in Germany, how does this work with politicians and the automotive industry? It's really very much like, you know, um, like an octopus, everything together. And um, the, the problem here is that that is also con conserving everything because they are making so much money on the things they do at the moment. And the question is, why should they change something then? Only if they're starting to do less money. And that can happen, for example, when someone emerges with a full electric drive concept. Or, for example, if owning a car itself will not be that important anymore. And that's also what's happening at the moment, that more cars are, for example, shared, that it's more about mobility processes and not owning a car yourself. And that can be a huge problem. And that's also... Um, we're getting more to the connectivity part there as well. Why the manufacturers try to do new services, for example, those calling services, you know, concierge services, you put a button in there, um, I can also show you that very soon, or you get some apps on your smartphone, on your, on, your, on your Apple Watch, and then you pay for the app. So what the future of the, of the business process will, and that will also be very important for, for you in your jobs, there won't be so much money made with the car itself because also, you know, when there's more automation, the car's cost will also shrink again. You will more make money with additional services. And maybe you can get a car pretty cheap, but everything is done in the middle's console and you maybe have to pay 10, 10 euros that the AC is working. And then you have to pay another $10 uh, to get the GPS system. And I think the same will be happen like we've seen with the gaming industry and for the time you go to um, to an electronic store and get for you know 70 bucks you get a new game on the on the DVD nowadays maybe the game is for free but you have to pay if you get a a, a big uh, mall or a big sword or you know and then you have to pay for that one and I think 
something like the same will happen for the automotive industry. And that brings us totally into the second mega trend for the connectivity. You see, this is here the Jaguar Land Rover system they're using for the connectivity. I think it's a very bad solution because you need an extra app for that one. So it's not available with, for example, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. And that's the point where I think the German manufacturers have figured out that one quite well because they are now, all the cars that are coming out now, they have the possibility to plug in with um, Android Auto, Mirror, Link or Apple CarPlay. And the big advantage is you do not need an app for that. You just plug in your phone and that's it and it's starting automatically. The extra prices for that one are at the moment at about 200, 250 euros if you just get the connectivity. Most of the time it's also included in those big GPS systems, but then they are very expensive. And even for premium cars for maybe $100,000 or, or, or euros, you have to pay the GPS extra for about 3,000 or maybe even 4,000. That's, um, yeah, that's a really uh, strange thing, but that's also how they earn the money. You had a, you had a question? Yeah, we, well, we've, um, we've seen the um, A7 uh, um, as a concept there. Um, at the moment, where there's, these, um, there's a um, Toyota, um, also a new model, it has about 80,000 euros in Germany. Um, it's a Mirai. Um, so this was kind of the first real serial model alongside with the uh, uh, Hyundai iX35. So it's a Tucson in the, in the fuel cell mode. Those two vehicles are available at the moment. But they're highly, um, uh, highly subsidized because if you would sell them at a real market price, they would be like, it's, it's inconceivable. I mean, who would pay 150,000 euros for a Hyundai iX35? No one. I think at the moment it's also like 60, 70,000 euros. So they're not making money of it, but they're putting it on the market. Indeed, it's a good solution because you have huge range. There's no problem. And also the refueling process is very good. So you can just refuel it like you would do it with normal fuel. Um, so that's very promising. The question there is um, which technology will be cheaper first? And at the moment it seems like the, the normal battery electric thing will be cheaper first. It is already right now. Um, I don't know if the fuel cell will get less expensive quite soon. It is a good solution in general also because um, the hydrogen is, you know, one of the, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, we are everywhere. You just have to access it. That's the, the main problem, why it's so expensive. I mean, I think there has to be some, maybe some innovation where you get this process on a, on a cheaper level, for example. That could be a major factor. And um, that's also one reason it might also be relevant when you're maybe one of the big car managers one day. Um, you always have to look ahead what might be coming in the future, what you're not expecting. So. You sometimes question maybe when you see some car manufacturers doing a lot of technologies at the same time. They, do, they are not doing that because they know, they're doing that because they don't know. They don't know what's maybe coming ahead, but then they have kind of everything already a little bit tested out and you see, oh, there's a new innovation, maybe it's better to go in this direction. But the main thing that the German industry has missed that they, are, they have been focusing too much on the petrol and the diesel issue and with the diesel scandal, that one has, you know, put more um, sense towards the electrification also in the population as well. Um, even though if the diesel issue itself, just on an environmental perspective, it's more hypocrisy, to be honest. You know, I'm, I'm not defending Volkswagen at all, but they, what they've done was really bogus. Um, but if you think about, um, you know, for example, you, you all heard of this massive gas leak in, uh, in California. I think there's uh, like climate emissions uh, every day it was calculated that you could drive with I think 2 million Volkswagen Golf TDI 24-7 uh, in a circle around that one and you have the same kind of emissions. Um, or what I've um, mentioned initially you know, with, also with, with animal abuse, um, you can have one stake or you can drive 250 kilometers with a car. One stake requires 50,000 liters um, of water. It's inconceivable, people are most people are not really aware of that. But the, um, we also have, um, hear something of the, of the lecturer of Jeremy Rifkin quite soon. The main problem of you know, energy use and, um, and all of the climate change is not the car industry. It's really the meat and dairy industry. And I'm not saying this because I'm selling any books. I don't have anything to sell here. It's just pure fact. You can check out this, those facts at, at the UN. Of course, we have to get our cities clean. That's very important for our health because we're also getting cancer from all of the uh, micro particles that are going out there. But for the whole climate perspective, it's more important that we start stop eating meat and not that we stop um, driving cars. That if you just 
put it in, a, in perspective. There was another. It's a very good. It's a very good point um, that um, you know the, the life cycles have become shorter. Um, in the past, some car generations have been on the market for like ten years, twelve years. Now the current lifespan um, is about seven years, eight years. In between, you usually have a facelift or maybe two facelifts. Um, and we see some manufacturers there again, Tesla again. I have to mention, they say, okay, when some new stuff is coming out, we're adapting our cars that you can, for example, get updates for the autopilot, and we're also promising you we can change the battery later on. So if we have a bigger battery, we can change it. I think what you've mentioned is a crucial selling factor for future customers. They have a need to develop you know, kind of a promise to say, if we have new technology, we are able to, to change that one. And so far, well, as a car it is, as a manufacturing process has gone to, they have maybe gone in a totally wrong direction because, you know, 10 years ago, everyone could change here a headlight at the, at the Opel Astra. Nowadays, hardly anyone can because you have to go and put it on, uh, on, the, on the workshop, maybe you have to get from behind and pull half the car uh, out of each other, that um, you can change only the headlights. And that was, again, because they wanted to make more money in the shops. Everyone has to go put the car to the shop. Um, well, they can do that, but they have to ensure that they really can change the technology. So I think what you've mentioned is a, a crucial selling factor that you can also do advertising with, because I think it will indeed be a big, big problem if you're just you know, investing big money, but then maybe uh, have something totally different in a couple of years, definitely. So, um, we'll just continue on with them, um, then we have um, a free discussion around very soon. I just want to point out here with the connectivity stuff, showing some examples. This is the Opel OnStar system. This is one of the examples where you can uh, press the button. You can also listen to that one here. I did it on a Saturday morning. So it just was a live test. Sending the, the vehicle position. Let's see. Okay, says so that this call could be recorded. Hallo, hier ist der Thomas Marschlag. Ich mache nur einen Test in Hof. I'm just testing this because I'm doing a car review. <laughs> just testing if it works. Hello. So, so it really works. Hello. Say greetings to all. Uh, oh, that's, that's a great service. We can also talk in English. So maybe you just say hello to Autogefühl viewers because we are filming this right now. <laughs> oh, that's great. So you, so you could recommend me the next uh, restaurant, for example, or could also help me if I um, maybe need some, uh, maybe to repair the car or something like that. I can certainly do that for you. So are you looking for a restaurant right now? Uh, well, actually, no. I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's a really, uh, really funny stuff. And so that was just, I mean, the question is something, uh, something I don't need it. I have my smartphone. I look, look the restaurant up myself and that's it. But um, maybe now when you're in, in, in traffic and just want to have a more relaxed experience that can help. Um, at the moment, some included, for example, the fees for those services in, for example, a bigger GPS package that you have it for one, two or three years. But then, of course, you have to pay for it. And that was my point earlier, that you will have to pay for those additional services you can use. Um, in Germany, it's not really big yet. In the US, it's, it's a bigger thing. Um, more cars have that and uh, more people are, for example, also using it. Um, I'm not sure if it has something to do with the German mentality that, you know, I wanted to control everything on my own. I don't know. But um, a big um, regulation thing, what's happening here as well, that's a little bit connected. You've seen also on, on, on the car ceiling there, we have those SOS systems that are automatically giving a note when, for example, an accident was happening. And those will be mandatory in the future. And so they are more and more introducing it. More, some car manufacturers, just doing it voluntarily already right now, but soon everyone has to implement it. And I think it's also a good system. But the interesting is that by this regulation, you already got the technology inside to have, you know, the, for example, phoning possibility that then also can be used for the additional services. And that's also one of the main topics because all of the additional services, the car will most of the time already be able to offer that, but maybe it's not activated. And from a customer perspective, that can be a little bit ridiculous, and maybe we'll be, we'll be arguing about that. Um, for example, also some autopilot features. You have to build the car that's already able to do that, 
But then you will, for example, pay to activate it. Yeah, it's, um, well, they, have, they want to make money, and if they make less money on the traditional way, then it's maybe that way. So, and then, talking about the autonomous feature, we get to our third and last mega trend, and that is really the autonomous driving. Um, there, back to the Tesla again. Um, I would not rely on it 100% yet, but I would say 90%. You all still have to be, you know, conscious <laughs> to control everything. Um, but it's working already pretty well. And um, especially in Germany, this is a, on one hand a big problem because people say, especially, you know, males above 50, this is, you know, devil's work. I will never drive an autonomous car. I want to drive the car on my own. Uh, I want to produce my accident on my own. <laughs> and, but this is totally changing with the new generation. I got one of my um, uh, younger fellow co-workers, he's saying, uh, it's totally boring to drive a car. Um, no, I prefer driving a train. This is so totally cool with the autonomous drive. And so you see that it's, it's also a question of, of generations. There again, also for your future jobs maybe, um, you more have to listen to the younger generation because those ones are your future customers. And um, of course you have to offer something for, for everyone. But here for example, well you don't have to get the auto, autopilot. You can get it. So you can just drive the car manually. and. What we're heading to is a transition where, especially in traffic situations on the motorway, there will be the autopilot feature more activated. And then if you get to the countryside, maybe you want to have some fun, then it will be deactivated. But I'm also looking forward to a future. I'm not sure if I like it, but I think it will happen um, at some stage, maybe in 20, 30, 40 years. I'm not sure if driving yourself will still be allowed. Because if you then look at the facts that 90% of every accident is induced by humans, and you have to think about, do we spare 300,000 lives per year? Or are we enabling people to, to still drive manually? Maybe at some point you will just decide for the lives then. I don't know. This one here is the system that Volvo is offering. They introduced a little bit with, with the Volvo XC90 with a new car. But there the autopilot, you pay, I think, 1,500 euros extra. And it's kind of nonsense because it's working, I think, between 30 and 80 kilometers. And I mean, that's only applicable for the traffic situations. With the S90 or V90, they will improve this autopilot feature that was always going until 130. The E-Class, by the way, this one was already a little bit ahead. The autopilot works there, I think, until 180, 190 kilometers an hour. Very important for German customers <laughs> that you can also drive 180 on the autobahn uh, with the autopilot. Okay, we have to think about if that's, uh, that's really making sense. Uh, one of the key factors as for security, what will be coming here, and there Volvo is also getting some good points, is those automatic braking functions. Um, and the German manufacturers, especially the premium ones, they also introduce it more now with the base models. I think it's, um, it should be a standard that you get this autonomous braking from the standard equipment, not with the optional equipment. And there has been some bad uh, development now with the Euro NCAP, that's this organization that is testing the wheel, crash testing it. They are now introducing it two separate ratings, one with standard equipment and one with high top security equipment. And so a car can get three stars and five stars. And the manufacturer can say, oh, well, if you want to get the secure car, get all of the extras for 30,000 euros extra. We are having a good secure car. I think it's the wrong direction. You more have to get it as it was used to. When a car doesn't have um, like everything that it on the standard equipment, it should get a bad rating because that so far made the manufacturer the pressure higher to put everything in the car already. Now we're getting more and more towards the future. What we've shown with BMW that we converge all of the technology of, of autonomous driving and um, the connectivity um, and also the electrification. This is the F015. It's a Mercedes concept that was shown in the U.S. and um, it looks a little bit strange on the first hand, also really not set on driving your own. You see also that the passengers, they face each other. And that is what, especially for Mercedes and also VW with the latest concepts we're heading for, to make the car more an experience for the group. They have this thought in their head that maybe two, three people are driving in the cars, then they share their music, and uh, there are also some systems, for example, Volkswagen has shown in the, the so-called buddy concept, it's a, of the T6, the transporter concept. Um, 
that all of the smartphones are recognized of the four people in there, and then the computer matches the, uh, the music and sees, oh, maybe what could be the best favorite music for everyone, you know? And so it's getting the right music program for the trip. And, um, well, ecosystem we have here in this concept from Mercedes, that we have everything set on the infotainment, that we have huge screens on the inside where you can have some, um, some interactions and also look at the map where you're heading to, or maybe also uh, watch your favorite movies while that. You see there's a really freaky concept from the inside, <laughs> it looks like, and also this kind of lounge chairs that are being used. And there's always the question is, how far is that really from reality? Well, it's not that far, um, especially as for the autonomous drive, it's possible, period. The question is just, what about the governmental regulations? And there we have, again, a big difference between the German manufacturers and, for example, also the Tesla. The Germans, they are also a little bit more conservative. They sometimes wait for the regulations or wait until their lobbyists induce the regulations. Uh, and not only, you know, push forward in, in such kind of way. But why is the German industry in the automotive sector still that successful? Well, they are, of course, also innovation driver. Um, not they are testing out something new and, you know, like trial and error. But when they bring something new, you can be sure it is also refined. And therefore, there were hardly any situations where people worldwide got in a German car and were disappointed because some new feature maybe wasn't working that properly, then you know if you get that feature, it does work, and you're also satisfied with it. And I think this customer satisfaction is also one of the um, main aspects. And Volkswagen has struggled in the US, especially because also of that customer satisfaction, because they also had quality issues in their plant in, in Mexico. And um, most of the time, if you want a Mercedes, Audi, or BMW, you want to buy this kind of German experience to your country. But there the cars were made in Mexico and um, it was also quite remarkable. We have here some quality tests as well, where Volkswagen is usually scoring quite well. There's only one vehicle that is scoring very bad in durability ratings, and that's the Beetle. That's the only car that is built in Mexico and gets shipped over to Germany to sell in Germany. So, um, you know, it has nothing to do with Mexico, it has more to do with um, the bad quality management they have there that they're maybe not investing as much money there as they would do here. Um, but they said they want to make it, you know, on a very high level address it um, now, and also the new models are coming, for example, all of the Volkswagen Tiguan, and there they don't want to build different models. For example, with the Passat, you don't get the new Passat. They want to build the same models then in Mexico and in Germany. This one was another concept here we seen initially. You get, for example, phone calls in this BMW i8 concept. You see it on the steering wheel if you're in the autonomous mode at the moment or not, if you're driving yourself. And there you can also change because BMW is really paying attention that they don't screw up their existing customers because if they would say, oh, we're going fully autonomous, then their, their driving focused customers would say, oh, what, where's my brand, where's my BMW gone? Therefore, they're stressing the fact Drive, you know, have fun if you want to. Activate or deactivate the autonomous drive here. You see it's changed to red color. It means, you know, racing style. Get uh, everything in your own hands again. Or you can just activate the autonomous mode again. I think it, that's where we're kind of heading to, to converge all the technologies. And, um, well, maybe also change from one to another. But at the end, maybe we'll land up with one technology. But at the moment, we're in this transition stage, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, the new USP for CarMax, that's, um, that's one of the things that has been addressed by marketing, I think maybe only uh, over the last couple of months, because it has um, really changed a lot. Um, because indeed so far, especially for example, Audi is, is doing that for the, for the refinement. Um, the Audi interiors are more often better than some of the very high luxury manufacturers. For example, where you pay even double or triple the amount of an, of an Audi, and still they have a very refined interior, for example, like real metal buttons, and um, Audi has an own laboratory for the sound, which costs millions, and they really design every sound of every single knob you turn. When you have this knob in the central console, it makes it click, 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 and it somehow kind of a pleasing sound for your ear, and that transports this quality. That's what they're doing at the moment, and it's also one of the reasons why people are buying this car, and also um, 
why everyone wants to go premium. We see more and more manufacturers want to have a separate premium brand. Uh, you know, for example, also uh, Infinity with, with Nissan and Strength, even Citroën doing the separate premium brand DS. They all want to make more money because when you buy a premium car, it's not you really compare what am I paying, what am I getting. Um, the investment of money is due to the emotional factor a little bit disconnected from your purchase process because you say, I, I just want that, period. And the question is indeed if you have less and less for example, nice metal knobs to turn because something happens autonomously. It's maybe you can compare it with today's GPS systems. At some GPS systems, you, you, you look at it and say, okay, well, they work, they get me to a destination, but somehow I have a, not a good quality feeling. And some other GPS systems, you look at it and say, wow, it's just a crystal clear display, it's a great resolution, and there's a great voice coming over there. And I think they have to create a brand world in there, the same what, we, what they do with um, keeping very hard to their certain CI. So I think it's just transportation to the CI, to the interior. Maybe it's um, even more offering new possibilities because all of these um, visual worlds they have so far, they can only use in marketing or for example like that, they could be introduced in the car then, in all of the visualization surrounding. For example, also continues also with headlights or in the or taillights, we also got some and this organic LEDs where you can produce some real light shows. And that might also happen in the, in the interior, for example, where nowadays we got a um, Rolls-Royce interior with a ceiling, with a star ceiling, with certain LEDs. We we'll maybe also see it in the Audi A3 that we have, you know, when you get in autonomous mode, you can have an LED ceiling and create a certain mood, for example. I think those ones could be um, the possibilities that lying ahead for the manufacturers there. So, and um, one more technology I want to show you here as well. Um, this one here is a so-called V-charge system, it's also with the Golf. This one here is not driving autonomously with the driver, it's driving fully autonomously with itself, kind of. Um, the car was programmed before, but in the future it could also happen that the car is doing that totally on its own. And the main purpose of that is to ease the parking process that you just get in front of the, um, of the parking lot, get out of the car, and um, the car drives in it on its own. And then there's also this robot charging station. So at the moment I'm holding it as a demonstration, but usually the car would park itself there. And the system is already working on this concept stage. And then there's this robot charging up the car and you maybe go to work or you go shopping uh, or you maybe go to the train station here in Amsterdam or to the airport and come back from your appointment a day later and your car is fully charged. So there are those possibilities, but well, there can be good future concepts, but the question is, who pays for that? Who pays for this machine that is at the moment costing a lot of money? Who wants to pay this? Uh, do you want to pay maybe 300 euros for your parking process in Amsterdam if you can also get it for 50, 50 euros, for example? only that your car is charged. I think that is um, the main question here. Another concept is the, when we go more to the trucks, another converging technology will also change the job possibilities. Um, this one here has been conducted lately, this road test, it's also working pretty well. So you can either drive the car totally autonomously or you can create this pl platoon where more trucks are driving behind each other and they kind of hook together and then you can do some more relaxing stuff. Uh, we have on those videos strong reactions, especially from truck drivers from the US saying, um, you know, Mercedes is killing our jobs. That won't happen so far because, especially from the governmental regulations, um, it will take a lot more time until the government allow such a huge car to be driven just without someone. But I think what's more happening is that truck drivers will not only, you know, be the, like the manual driving people, they more maybe also become logistics people that, you know, in the truck, letting more drive autonomously and while they're doing that, they may be doing some logistics work. Uh, what about the route? Can it be um, uh, optimized? Let's check and check the data. Um, what about, you know, the, the next destination? Is there maybe a change in, in the orders? Does the supermarket uh, need more bananas now here? And we maybe adapt to that one. So I think it will just change the topic, it will not make them totally obsolete. 
They also have the autonomous braking function um, uh, inbuilt there and just the autonomous braking function, that will be also mandatory for trucks in, in the, at least in the whole EU. I think they will also do it worldwide because this one can really change lives. Um, I've, I've seen it um, so far uh, when a truck runs on, a, you know, on, a, on the end of a traffic jam and it happens that like 10 or 50 normal cars are really squeezed to this size when the truck runs over it and it's uh, totally devastating. And with this autonomous braking function, this can, of course, be prevented then. Um, this technology is, of course, very relevant because the truck traffic has been increasing over the years, especially transit truck traffic throughout um, different countries. And this can, of course, also save massive amounts of money because you save fuel, you're running at uh, better routes, better speeds. Um, you can also um, prevent traffics because also traffics are usually induced by humans there is this nice experiment where you have like six or seven cars just running in a circle and driven manually. And they run maybe at a speed of 15 kilometers an hour and it works. But at some point, someone makes a mistake, maybe breaks a little bit. And after a couple of minutes, this driving circle stands still. That just happens. It's human. And this won't happen here with the highway pilot system when you have enough trucks, of course, using it. There won't be many trucks yet who use the system. In, in the US, there are always uh, these, these freight liners that are, uh, I think, uh, just a handful that are on the way with, uh, with a similar system. Um, especially here, it will increase even more than in the passenger traffic, because here it really can pay off. When you buy an electric car at the moment yourself, it's more like, you know, you, you personally want to do this. But here, it can also be really a business incentive. If you're a businessman and think about, you want to do that to your feet, you want to make it more secure, you maybe want uh, not to waste your time of your drivers, you want your drivers to make something else. And for example, you can for example, make uh, fuel, fuel savings uh, and also save time by that. And this one here is Jeremy Rifkin, and I also want wasting to give you a little bit of his speech. He was holding this speech on the truck line. event we've just seen. Here in Germany. We're wasting the water. Why is the television on? We're wasting the electricity. And one I particularly like, this may be hard to hear in Germany, why is this hamburger on my plate, <laughs> this piece of beef? You know, the number one cause of CO2 emissions are buildings, but in Germany you've converted two million buildings to power plants to produce renewables. That's good. The number three cause of CO2 emissions is transport, and now Daimler is going to take us into a world where we can reduce those emissions dramatically. But the number two cause of climate change is never discussed. It's actually beef production and consumption in animal husbandry. The fact is, kids are coming home and say, did this hamburger come from a rainforest? Did they have to destroy the tree canopy for three little inches of topsoil to graze my cow? The kids understand when they destroy the tree canopy for the soil, for the hamburger, there may be rare species of plant and animal life that only live in that tree canopy. They're done. They're extinct. And the kids know if the tree canopy is raised for the soil to grow the hamburger for my meal, it means the trees are not absorbing CO2 from industrial emissions. That means the temperature of the planet goes up. That means the water cycle is on runaway feedback. That means some farmer 20,000 miles away has, summer fl has spring floods and summer droughts and can't feed her kids because of the hamburger. The children are learning ecological footprint. They're learning that everything we do intimately affects the well-being of some other human, some other creature, the planet we live in. It's not academic. This is actually the way this organism called the Earth, this biosphere, operates. So I just wanted to show you this piece because I was really astonished. Mercedes paid a lot of money for this guy here to show up and tell this to the audience. And Jeremy Rifkin is one of the <laughs> world-renowned experts for you know, future developments. And um, for example, the, the Chinese government is orienting um, their new business plan according to his advice. Um, the big major energy corporations in Germany, for example, are working now to restructure their process, process according to his advice. Also, our Chancellor Merkel was um, you know, setting up business standards in, for, for the regulations according to his advice. And um, so it's not like you know, there are some you know, very extreme activists saying this. This is now becoming common sense, and I just, you know, want to um, strengthen your senses for that. 
we have to focus on the big picture and we have really to think about our planet because the thing where we you know, create um, business models by destroying the planet and say, okay, just the economy counts and that's it, that's kind of over now. Not only because we should care about more the, about the environment, but only because we cannot do business further on like that. So it will not be possible to earn money on, the, on further technologies in the future where we just you know, destroy everything. And also you have to think about the customers. At the moment, you still have enough customers saying, I want the most power, I want the biggest V8, and uh, I don't care about anything else. But the future customers will then give you questions like, why don't you have an electric car that has 400 kilometers of range? And uh, why can I get, can't so get some alternatives on the seats? I get inquiries from people saying like, um, I wanted to have a premium SUV uh, with, with fake leather. And I found that, okay, it's possible on the Mercedes GLC. I'm now buying a Mercedes GLC. And this um, effect is still totally underestimated with mo most, of the, um, most of the companies. They're still working with the process. Let's give them the cars we want to see and not the cars that the customer wants to see. And well, I think your main task, if you're working in the automotive industry, will be to change that, to change the perspective, to say, okay, we want, we want to focus on what the customer wants to have, what the future technology will hold, and how we can make good money, but still without wasting our planet. And I think that's about it, you know, where all of this converging of the technologies we've discussed here today is heading to. And although we have major challenges to face, definitely, I think that's at least some good outview for here today. So that's the lecture part. Thanks. And <laughs> <laughs> and so just to um, some pictures to enjoy, um, so we have to think about it. It is still possible to have fun and care about the planet. Um, to also cut it loose, I'm also driving a car, I'm also traveling, I'm driving with cruise ships, but still I can live, you know, environmentally friendly. So both is possible. and. Uh, this one is, by the way, one of the most fun stuff you can do in a car. Driving on the ice lake is even more exciting than, you know, on this very dry, rice, dry race tracks. Because here you can really hammer the throttle and still drive very smoothly because the car is really doing a small belay on the ice. So um, if you ever want to do this, um, I, can, I can really recommend it. It's also possible to do that, by the way. It's, um, it's not that, that, that cheap. But um, the manufacturers offer that, that everyone can actually do that with the driving experience program. And if you want to do something like this, pay money for such a car ride, I would definitely recommend you do it on an ice lake and um, not on a dry racetrack. You'll have more, more fun doing that here. <laughs>